Hi, everybody. This is Bob Ose, and welcome to our Friday community gathering. Um, this is uh, October 23rd. Do dates mean anything to us anymore? <laughs> it's like, it's just like another day in COVID. Um, so here we are another day in COVID. And um, we're doing this every week because I'm kind of sensitive to the reality that people are feeling isolated and um, why not why not do something where people can come together like they do here uh, all come and meet each other uh, we got 63 people a very good turnout today uh, i'm very thrilled to have all of you with us uh, so i started doing this back in april uh, a lot of you heard this story already um, people who haven't on youtube will hear it now uh, when the city shut down on march 15th um, I went into a tailspin. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what I was going to do with True. I thought, gosh, I guess we had a long run. I've been doing this for 28 years. I guess maybe this is this is the universe's way of saying stop. Um, I gave it some thought uh, through the panic and decided to ask everybody how they felt about coming and do, doing these uh, Friday gatherings. And people were very, very re receptive to it. And people seem to really want to have an opportunity to meet other people in the community and talk about what they're going through and how they're feeling. Um, so here we are, uh, April 17th, I did my first one of these. This is, I think the number, I think this is number 28. Uh, every week, I'm trying to create something that is consistent and dependable in a world that has become like totally out of control, totally, totally weird. Uh, none of us have ever been through this before. Uh, so I'm glad that, that it's serving a function. I'm glad everybody's happy to come together. I'm honored and I'm moved and really it, it makes my life a lot easier uh, knowing that this is working for, for people and that we're able to do this every week. So uh, thanks all for being here and Today, we're going to talk to Neil Davidson, who's with a company called The Shared Screen. Um, we've been talking a lot about live presentations, and we've been talking about virt virtual presentations, and we've also uh, started shifting away from live presentations and started talking about pre-recording and post-production editing. Um, we're, we're, we're coming back to live today. We're going, we're going to go really... Neil has a very strong aesthetic about this and very strong feelings about about this. And I'm I'm actually going to shut up and I'm going to introduce Neil to you. And he's going to tell you a little bit about what he does and why he does it and why he does it the way he does it. That's exactly right, Bob. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm so glad to be able to speak to True and join this community. Um, and without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share through some, some visual aids on a presentation here. No, let us, get, let us get to know you first. Want to chat a little bit first? Sure. sure yeah, first. tell us a little bit about yourself and about what, why, what, where uh, Shared Screen came from and what you did before the, before the pandemic. Absolutely. Well, um, there is a, there's a huge difference between performing live in front of an audience or on set and performing virtually to this tiny little camera. Uh, so I was primarily an actor back in New York City, but I also had my own small production company that was doing web series and audition material and YouTube videos. And when everything shut down, the weekly masterclass of working actors that I was in moved on to Zoom. And we started doing the scenes we had been doing in class, but we were adapting them to be in the context of a Zoom call, not just trying to shoot a play like we were in the same room or, or pass the teacup back and forth through the camera, but really change that setting. And we found that it really, really worked. So we put on some closed experiments for invited audiences of full adapted Zoom plays, and we got an excellent response. So in this time of isolation, I thought we had a great opportunity to create a new art form, to bring hope, to put um, more actors and creators back to work. So I founded the Shared Screen, which is a 501c3 nonprofit production company to create live virtual theater. 
Okay, that gives us a little bit of context, and I, th I think it's I, I I think that was I think that's helpful for us to know. Sure. Um, the uh, before and before you go into the presentation, I want to also ask you a few questions. Um, what what are the elements of a good Zoom presentation, a good live presentation in your in your estimation? And you know, a lot of this is, is obvious stuff, so I'm not I'm not asking for any trick. It's not a trick question or anything. Sure, sure. Well, um, I'll I'll say overall, um, what we've seen a lot of Zoom theater right now. For, for me, I think the major stumbling blocks that happen are when we have productions that pretend that, that it's live theater, like I said earlier, sort of passing the teacup, um, that they're not embracing this as a medium. I think another big stumbling block happens when we have actors that aren't memorized, because that can really take the audience out of it. But what really works for a great Zoom production is an absolutely seamless audience experience from the moment they register um, to the moment that the show begins. And I'll kind of be showing ways that we've worked with, you know, creating a virtual lobby and always staying within the reality of a Zoom call so we never have those glitchy moments, um, but keeping it exciting, engaging, and driving quick, personal. Let's talk about those glitchy moments for a second. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do so that you don't have any problems with latency, uh, sure. things going off sync, uh, or even, well, I'm sure that you, that you, you make sure that your, your Wi-Fi and your connection is probably use a, use a hardwire ethernet connection. That and so much more. I mean, I have the specs on all of our actors and performers. We're always hardwired. I actually have, um, uninterruptible power backup sources on all of my tech and computers. Wait, and say, say that again, because yes. I didn't catch that. I have uninterruptible power sources that all of my computers and tech and Wi-Fi router are plugged into, even in case the power goes out. And we've even got a generator on my house now to make sure. Um, so we do everything we can to boost Wi-Fi. We also run through the show multiple times to test where any moments of glitch and lag might be happening. And we figure that out in terms of having really high quality audio and microphone. And then the obvious things of turning off everything else that's running on your computer, so on and so forth. So you get the maximum out of the machine you have. Can you share a little bit about the, uh, the specifics of, of what you would recommend for people who want to do this? Like uh, Absolutely. Um, in terms of webcam, the Logitech 920 series is kind of the gold standard of the industry. Um, in terms of sound, we all use uh, Blue Yeti microphones that are great because um, they can also pick you up even when you move to the back of the room. So that's my my sound and, and video recommendations. Oh, it's interesting because I've had other actors talk about um, some sort of earbud uh, microphone that they use so that they can move around and no matter where they are, the bike is still picking them up. Yeah, we found that sometimes with the earbuds, we didn't want to risk those falling out because we do a lot of movement. Also, uh, in terms of lavalier mics, you get bounced back and forth. Uh, so we found that the Blue Yeti to cover a whole space and just keep it out of frame was the most seamless way to use mics. I assume it's multi-directional, obviously, right? So it's it um, is. so we're yeah, all right. So um, oddly enough, my mic on my Mac is incredibly sensitive. If 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 my partner sneezes three rooms away, it picks it up. Yeah. So, Oftentimes, uh, the technology you get with good laptops or new good webcams can work really well too. I have a desktop. <laughs> okay, um, <clears throat> so um, let's also talk about who helps you position yourself. Let me just say, you're, you're, everybody's going to see this when you when you do, do your sh screen share. Uh, but let me let them let them know ahead of time that you you do not do talking heads. You do full body movement, and you do you use your entire room um, and. Uh, Tell us a little bit about what that process is like. How do you know where to place yourself? And how does how do you know how you're framed um, in a scene? Sure. So um, we've spent now eight months working weekly in our master class incubating this material. So we've kind of pushed what is believable for the camera directions and how far you can get away. We have our, our director is actually um, our teacher from class who's been working with us. and. As an actor, uh, I am always performing staring directly down the camera lens, so it maintains the illusion that I'm looking at the other actors. So I can't actually see what's going on on screen. So as actors, it is our job to 
know what we're doing and go about our tasks. And we trust our director who is kind of the silent viewer to tell us, great, that's a good spot to be in on screen, pause or create this moment here by coming a little closer or further. Uh, but I'll get more into that when we get in the presentation. I have some specific examples of sort of the secrets to directing for Zoom. So before we go into the Sheen, the Sheen Square, the Sheen Square, the Sheen Square, yeah. Before the we screen share for the shared screen, is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's right. Um, <laughs> I want to just ask the room uh, whether they have any questions in terms of how to set set yourselves up uh, for doing something like this. If you if you have any questions about how this is done, um, because you're, he, uh, a lot of this is going to be covered probably. Um, Sam Sam Berland. Yeah, um, I wanted to find out what software you're using to put this together with. Zoom, we use the Zoom webinar platform and then all uh, transitions, intros and outros are screen shared via PowerPoint. So you're not using OBS or anything like that? We are not. Um, Elizabeth Layton, do you have your hand raised or is that, is that an old hand raise from earlier? Sorry, it's old, sorry. Okay. Uh, anybody else have any questions before we jump into um, Neil's presentation? Yes, this is Candy Carl here. I was wondering if a rough estimate of the cost involved in what he's brought together in order to facilitate his productions, uh, just a rough estimate would be great. Yeah, sure. In terms of um, all of the rights, in terms of paying our actors a stipend, uh, we had a three weekend run for tape. It was roughly $7,000 including all of our technical backups as well. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Okay, so take take the screen, share it. Well, I will live, share the screen. Live up, to your, live up to your name. Dun, dun, dun. Hello, everyone. Um, now we're sharing the screen. So like Bob said, I'm gonna be discussing, giving you kind of the, the tips and tricks of how we execute and embrace through this wonderful live web feeder medium. Um, it was my belief, like Bob said, um, it, it was tough times when everything shut down, but I, like many of you, believe that arts will find a way. And for me, that way was creating a new art form that could happen live over the internet. Something that embraces a new virtual medium that can keep theater alive, that can make it accessible to everyone across the web, that can create new opportunities for actors in these tough and difficult times. So I was faced with the challenge of how do you actually start a new medium? To give us a brief context, these guys did it really well. Think about the vaudevillians. When radio came along, the ones who embraced it and changed and adapted their acts and created a new art form in the new medium became stars. And now radio is something far beyond anything that they could have imagined. And we've seen that same thing play out across all mediums. I mean, think of the very early films all the way through Star Wars, all the way through Citizen Kane, or even thinking about the first TV that actually showed the sound equipment on the screen and then develop through Howdy Doody to now be virtual reality. So where I believe that we sit is at the beginning of what is actually a new art form in a new medium. And the exciting and hopeful opportunity we have here is where is it going to go? We're the ones who can offer and create direction and follow along. So what is this new medium that we're creating? Well, for us, the stage that we used to perform on is now the screens that we all share. The play that we used to watch on the stage is now a Zoom call where our actors are actually tuning in from across the country. I'm in Washington, DC, Travis is up in New York, and Chelsea is out in Los Angeles. But we all come together on the same screen for you to watch live for every night of the show. And the audience are you the invisible witnesses to what goes on, accessible anywhere for anyone with an internet connection. Now, the result is an intensely intimate new medium of live theater. I'm going to go ahead and play for you guys now a couple of our clips. Um, make sure that everyone is muted if we can. Uh, this will be about two minutes and 30 seconds. And just a disclaimer, the subject matter of this play is fairly mature and there is some strong content. Hey, man! <laughs> you pay, Vince! You always insist on getting things your way. What you're good at, John. Hmm? 
So why don't you just own up and admit to what you did? I'm calling her. Wait, stop. We both know that I did something wrong. So then tell me. But what does it matter? She'll pick up any second, John. Erase it. No. Vince. What? Delete it. Don't feel like off any time, John. Vincent. Vincent. Hey. Hey, Amy. Hi, Vincent. Surprise. Then I guess I'm just one of those people who don't have the courage. You think? It's hard to say. It is. You too. That is so fucking typical. I gotta go. John! What? Are you sure? Goodbye, Amy. Amy! I am trying to be honest. Why now? Because I haven't seen you in 10 years. But why now? Because when Vince played me back the tape, it hit me what I had done. And I hope you die for it and go to hell. And if there is no hell, I hope that you Suffer on your way to death. <laughs> Good luck tomorrow, John. Thank you. Goodbye, Vincent. Goodbye, AB. It was so good to see you. God, wait. So we put 90 minutes of that live out there to an audience. And what we discovered was we found something that was more impactful than we ever could have imagined. And here's an example of some of the audience feedback that we would get. After every show, we realized that we needed an opportunity for the actors, the artists, and the audience to connect with each other. So through the Zoom webinar platform, we actually have a conversation with the audience after the show where we unmute them and we talk about the content of the play and how it hit them and we offer everyone a chance to connect live sort of the way that they would in the theater while things were going on. Um, and this was from our opening night, actually. Every, I'm telling you, I was hanging on everyone's word and, and it took me a while to catch my breath afterwards i was still oh my oh you know that kind of thing i said oh my god you guys are great really great you know you talk about the future you know you are the future of uh, of the theater uh and i'm proud to say that i'm here i don't know if it's the beginning or the middle or i don't know really well, just know marcia we are extending so we will be extending this and there's our trusty director coming in to plug our extension. Um, I, I later learned that, that that wonderful woman had actually been an usher on Broadway for 30 years and had been out of work for the first time um, since uh, her, her the beginning of career when the shutdown in New York hit. Um, so obviously very touching for me to understand her and her perspective. And we realized that we had something that really worked. So. What I want to explain is how in this virtual medium, the things that we have discovered that make this art work. And the first thing is how do you adapt a play that was written to be three people in one room on a stage to three people in one Zoom? And the first thing you have to do is you have to make some plot changes and you have to build some sets. So the top corner here we can see, this is actually a picture of the set that I'm acting on. You can see my lighting and camera setup where I have the lights behind the camera and I've got my microphone down to the corner. This will help me stay lit and help my camera equipment be out of the way of the single shot, which is what the audience gets of what looks like a fancy hotel room. 
Now, I set up a 360 degree set in my bathroom because I was actually performing off my phone. And you'll later see some clips of me moving around the bathroom with that. But holding my phone, these are the shots that you get as I can go up and down and spin around in there. Uh, for Travis, we had a slightly different set build because he's working in what's supposed to be a dingy motel room. And we wanted to get some depth and different colors in his life. So here's a picture of his setup, which you can actually see reflected on the TV screen in the background. The second thing is plot adaptations. What was originally two guys meeting out at a bar, we rewrote to be two guys hopping on a Zoom call together to get ready to go out before they meet. Or the DA who barges in to the hotel room now becomes the DA that, surprise, gets invited to pop onto a Zoom call. Or even me exiting and returning to the motel room now becomes me exiting the Zoom call and then popping back on from a different location. So some recontextualizing into the world of Zoom. The second thing we realized, and this goes to the direction that Bob was kind of talking about earlier, is how do we create interesting dynamic visual screen pictures? And the first thing we realized was order of entry is really important. We can control what the audience is seeing left and right by the order in which the actors enter. And we realized that kind of the power position is the left side of the screen since we naturally read left to right. So here we have Travis is driving the scene from the left position. And then even when he's farther back from the camera, it still reads like he is driving and pushing the scene because he's staying on the left and Chelsea came in second. The other thing we realized is depth sort of equals emotional intimacy between the characters and between the audience. So at the beginning of the scene, you've got a couple that's in a fight. And by the end of the scene, we've got them reunited and there's some hope and some resolution. And then finally, we actually realized we could play with camera angle to show status of characters. So for me in this clip, I'm literally talking down to Travis. And then later in the play, I am being dwarfed by the conversation going on. And as actors, we were creating and moving all of those things live. Okay, I, this is this is where I want to come in and ask you a question because sure. it may not be as obvious to everybody as it is to you. Um, I noticed that you had a change of location. I did. Where, where did how did the how did your how did your laptop and your Zoom camera suddenly um, become in the in the bathroom? Yeah, I, in about two slides, I'm actually going to show a video of that transition and how it works. Um, so right. we'll hold that thought and get to it because it is really cool and you just you just have to see it to believe it. Um, so the other question we had as actors, which of course artists and writers have when you're changing this medium, is when you're on stage or you're on film, you know where your audience is. They're behind a fourth wall or they're behind a camera and you know how to relate to your acting partner. But on Zoom, your partner's not in the room with you and you don't really know where your audience is. And we realized the key was to look directly down the camera lens because then what happens on the screen is the audience sees three people in a conversation, but as actors, we actually can't see each other. I said this to Bob earlier, but it's a really strange new practice to have to watch peripherally and listen and react to your partners but anytime you stop staring down that camera lens, it reads that you have completely checked out of the conversation and it takes the audience out of it for a split second. Um, and then you also have to keep looking no matter what task you're doing. So whether you're folding laundry or brushing your hair or ironing a shirt, the more you're connecting to the camera, the more that it reads that you're actually talking to each other. So we ultimately realize an actor has a job of being four things in one. You've gotta be an actor, you're also your own stage manager because we actors are the ones in this medium who are performing and creating our own entrances and exits. We're actually pressing our video on, video off, mute, unmute buttons. You have to be your own camera crew because we're doing our own lighting and our own sound and creating our own camera angles live. And you also have to be your own complete geek in terms of setting up your wireless and your setup. Um, so what I'm about to show you in the next slide is gonna be a video clip uh, up at the top, you're gonna see what a video of my set is. I had my assistant was actually uh, taping me moving between the sets. And the bottom half of this screen is gonna be what you see on Zoom. I'm gonna be pausing and clicking through the talk through what's going on here. And this is where we'll see that transition that Bob asked about. So it'll kind of be more clear to you guys what I mean in terms of being our own camera. So at the beginning, Travis is the only one on screen. Again, that bottom screen is just him, so he's alone. And in a moment, 
you're actually going to see the top camera zoom in on my cell phone screen, which will show you what I and the audience see at the top of the show. So right there, this is what we're seeing at the top of the show as Travis gets ready to cue me in. And that's the same view the audience is seeing if they're on any of their devices. So as we back up, I'm gonna start moving around the set a little bit and get ready to make my entrance. And you'll actually see the moment where I press the button to pop onto the screen and start acting. So Travis is playing music. I'm watching for my cue, which is him jumping onto the bed. And on I go. Now I'm acting. So you can watch the way that I'm using the camera lens of my phone to be creating the screen picture live while we're performing. And again, this is always happening live. Now, the next thing is the transition that Bob talked about. I'm gonna move from this bathroom set into the hotel room. And it was written that I was moving from the bathroom to the hotel room as we're getting ready to go out. And in just a second, I make a quick flip where you'll see three of me as my camera comes on on my computer, as well as on my laptop or on my phone. So there was our quick moment of, sorry, let me get back there. Um, so there was our, our moment of transition as we get on to the laptop. Um, and then we keep going from the laptop for the remainder of this scene. This will also give you an idea of how the depth of it works. You see, I walk all the way almost to the back of the room in my set, but I'm still in frame and it looks like I'm talking to Travis. Can we just take a moment here? Again, this is take a look at the depth. In the top screen, you can see how far away I actually am from the laptop. And then on the bottom screen, you're seeing how it's actually reading to the audience on Zoom. And now we're gonna play with camera angle a little bit as I come in towards the camera and we have that sort of talking down moment to create some character and some depth of visual field where I'm all the way up in the camera and, and Travis is kind of in the mid range. And that's our Zoom demo. Um, and that's also available. We have a longer version of that on our YouTube channel. Uh, that I believe was our, our version from Twitter. So we've now got figured out how to perform and create art and direct and adapt into this medium. And we turned our eyes towards the audience experience, which included our virtual lobby, as well as some musical introductions that bring the, the audience in and out of the place. So just to give you a quick idea, this is the virtual lobby we use for tape, where for 30 minutes, we would have these slides rotating through, giving them information about the show, about the shared screen. We'd have our biographical information, and we'd even have directions for the audience that would pop up at the end in terms of closed caption, which we are very passionate about making theater accessible. So we closed caption all of our shows, as well as directions for Q&A and raising their hands. Um, and then we actually had a full set of slides to bring the audience in with some audio. Oh, that's right. This is the opening, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So the audience would see this, and immediately they would see Travis come on. <laughs> And we get our music. Uh, so, that, so that's how we kind of worked with getting an audience experience that gave them a sense of coming into a, a new sort of virtual space to be live together with us. And then again, after the show, we would bring everyone on for a post-show talk back and conversation, um, which we, we actually found uh, to be really impactful. And I'll talk more about this later, but for our December extension, we are actually bringing in and partnering with educational specialists from nonprofits and experts in the field of the subject matter of the play, which in this case is uh, rape and consent to actually sort of facilitate and foster those talkbacks with our audience, help them to be constructive and actionable. 
Okay, uh, so Neil, is there is there more um, screen share, or can we cut? Can we come back into the room? If you want to come back in the room, we totally can. Yeah, let's come back I, I have a little bit of stuff for sure. Oh, you have more. You have more screen share. I do. Um, I was just going to walk through a little bit of our our production and marketing stuff that, that we. You know what? Let's That's talk about what we saw so far, and then you can you can you can come back to this maybe. Sure, we'll see how we got time. So I mean, the, uh, one one of the one of the pressing questions for me is, what does your director do? Uh, uh, explain more. Uh, what about? Well, you said of, you uh, said in your presentation that you are your own director. Sorry, uh, we're our own camera crew. Um, so as an actor, we're our own camera crew, and we are making choices in terms of where we're going and moving. But our director is the one who's giving us a couple of things. One, uh, it's his vision in terms of the actual sets that we build and create. Is uh, like, what am I seeing in the character to give a sort of um, psychological background to what is going on, a fancy hotel room for an up and coming filmmaker, a very organized office for a lead DA, that sort of stuff. And he's also the one who's creating and giving us those moments of visual depth. So we show up as actors, we know the medium, we have a shorthand for, for ways to work in terms of we know close is intimate, we know far is distance, but we trust him to say, okay, keep that moment there, now is when you can come closer, back away, so on and so forth. Do you do you put marks so that you know what your spots are? So no, that we you 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 get you get it in your body and you remember where you are in the room. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, everybody in the room, I just I want you to remember that you have a virtual handshake. If you handshake, hand raise. If you um, go into your participants. Okay, Candy, Candy Carl, you have a question. Yes, this is the one that I ask everybody. Uh, the concern I have is working with equity versus SAG with these online live performances. What kind of contract are you working between the director, uh, your not-for-profit, and the actors? Sure. Uh, so we work completely non-equity. Um, so for this first production, we were actually doing 1099s. Um, we're not, we weren't under equity or SAG contract for this one. That's, that's the easy button. Not everybody yeah. has the easy button. Yeah, I mean, as we progress, that's that's a that's a question that we face for the next one. And I also know that you know, right now, the unions are also developing their own legality and contracts to be catching up with what's going on in streaming. So that's that's kind of a question we all have. Uh, but that's what we did it for this first one. We're so actually going to non-union production, but are all of the actors that you used and the director non-union as well? Correct. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. So uh, just to state the obvious uh, equity and sag after are uh not agreeing right now on what we're so everything that i've told you in weeks past throw it out the window that's it's it's a, every man for himself right now we're, we're all doing our best to figure out what what agreements that we should be using and it made a lot of sense to say that it should be sag after because this is a filmed medium um equity is not uh, taking that position anymore. So um, I think that we we can do what we what our conscience tells us to do, and I think we can work on with SAG after or equity contracts, whoever we go to. But um, th they're going to have to sort, settle that. Just for, for for your information, the Dramatist Guild has a new media contract too, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, Amy Amy Van Mersick from the uh, Dramatist Guild is going to be one of our guests. In one of the upcoming uh, meetings is going to talk about the dramatist guild new new media contract don't know how how it relates to the equity or sag new media contracts but we <laughs> can talk about it um so neil um is there anything that's there has to be something done in post-production because you, you're using the uh the, the backdrops and you're using using some mu uh, music cues and things like that. So Great. Let, let me actually be clear. We're we're not using any virtual backgrounds. We we build all of those sets. We're actually in those rooms. No, uh, you showed you showed at the beginning. You have the picture of the of the of the sign in the motel and the and the. And ah, the, so those aren't right. Those aren't virtual backgrounds. So that's a that's a PowerPoint. Those are actual PowerPoints that I'm sharing live. So that's just so, that's just like a screen share. That's that's literally a screen share. Everything happens through the Zoom webinar medium. So, and, so I'm sharing the screen. The lobby slides are just screen shared, and none, none of the performances are, are post produced. Who is happens. pushing the buttons during your performance? Um, that is my. I do have an assistant technical producer who is uh, JB, 
So we have our sort of, that's kind of what our equivalent to a stage manager would be as close as possible in terms of pressing those buttons. But those are all, it's the same way a stage manager is pressing go on the lighting board. Like we get it set up and it all happens live. Yeah. Okay, so there's, there's there's a cue book I guess involved. You you, you must is. do something that 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 sort of solidifies all this. Yes. Okay. So there's there's a cue book. I, th these are the details that you may not think to tell everybody. <laughs> or yeah. Um. Okay. Uh, Sam Berland. Yeah, I noticed that. I asked. Him a, I have a question. Why don't you have a monitor of what the other actors are doing? So you, if you're on Zoom you can see the return so you know where you're, you're going to come in in case you make a mistake. Sure, sure. Let, let me clarify that. So we, we actually, as actors on our screen, we can see uh, the same thing that the audience is seeing. So we do see the other two actors. When I earlier said that we can't really see the other two actors, meaning that um, since we're staring down our camera lens, we can only kind of see them peripherally, but we can see, we see here and listen in real time to what the actors are doing, so we have them on our computers. I noticed. No, I noticed also when the two actors, the woman and the guy, were speaking. The other guy with the beard, he was bent over the bed with his ass sticking up in the air. Shouldn't he have been out of the shot at that point? No, that's part of the play. Really? He's um in in the story of the play, he's he's a, a raging addict going through quite a breakdown. So we we let that happen. That was blocked and purposeful. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, so Sam, you good? I'm, I'm good. That's good. Thanks. So you were going to uh, do a screen share and start talking about promotion. Uh, yeah. I was just going to talk a, a little bit about the, the promotion marketing experience that we had. So guys, yeah. okay. Ralph Lewis has his hand up, but R Ralph, that's what see. If I threaten to go to another topic, then I start getting, I'll start getting people who, who have questions. Absolutely. I was, I was, I, I'm having fun in the chat section. So I was giving other people <laughs> a chance. Um, hey, I, I just want to preface and say uh, this week I directed a Zoom reading for Ego Actus. Last week I shot a SAG after a film of a short play. And this weekend we're doing our first live performance, uh, a benefit for Dixon Place. So theater authority for that, I believe. And we did use the short project agreement with SAG-AFTRA. Uh, and then the Zoom reading was non-union, but I think you can do theater authority for that if you wanted to as well. So my question is, um, have you tried to work at all with placing two actors on the screen and having them both in profile? And can you get them to look like they are talking to each other? I also wanted to know, are you doing anything about blackouts? Because when we do blackouts, some other screen comes up if all of the cameras are off. And, um, oh, you know, I sort of feel like the thing about this, it's backwards than theater. You want the audience the viewing in the dark, but you want to hear them breathing. Have you ever tried to have the audience microphones on so you, at least you can hear them laugh or applaud, even if you do get a dog barking in the background from time to time? Thank you. Address any or all of those questions. It doesn't matter, but thanks, uh, Bob. Did you write them all down, Neil? Um, I, I got the, the blackouts and the question about um, audience noise. Uh, I, I forgot what that the first ask was. A, 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 a two shot, uh, both in right. profile, shot, making uh, them look uh, like they're talking. Because I, 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 I don't know if you. I will address you... that for you. Yeah, uh, yeah, that that can be done. Uh, I had a conversation. John McDaniel is going to be a, our guest. He was the writer and director and the producer and the music director and set design. He did everything for Sticks and Stones, which is a, a new musical that was put together for Bennett perform performance for. Uh, uh, I think it's I think it's Broadway Cares Equity Fight Says. I forget now where it was the actors mm -hmm. fund. But uh, they do an, an astonishing amount of stuff in post production. So um, in terms of having people face each other, yes, you can plan it that way. And Neil was actually giving you a hint about that earlier. He said the thing to bear in mind with Zoom, it may change with other platforms, is that whoever speaks first is going to have the left position on your screen. And then whoever comes and speaks next is going to have the next position and so on. So it's uh, Zoom puts you on the screen in order in which it hears you. Yeah. So so you can you can plan 
on having one actor facing the, his right and the other actor facing their left. And it, it, you can look like they are talking to each other or confronting each other. What you can't do that you can do in post-production is you can actually do post-production editing of your screens to remove the line between the screens. And if you actually have planned it so that your backgrounds are similar, you can actually look like two people are in the room talking to each other and interacting. Um, there's a, a moment in the Sticks and Stones video that was astonishing. Uh, it absolutely looked like these two women were, were singing together a duet in the, same, in the same place. A lot of stuff can be done. You just have to plan it. You have to think ahead. You have to understand what your input looks like when it, when it becomes output. You have to look, you know, you, you're, you're doing, you're, you're, you're going to do it some way uh, and you have to understand what that's going to look like on the screen uh, to the audience. Um, Neil, do you want to actually uh, go go uh, on about that more? I mean, Bob, you, you covered that answer really well. That, that is something that, that we tried uh, in terms of using virtual backgrounds that matched up and sort of met halfway in the middle of the screen between two actors. Um, we found it more compelling of what we wanted to explore in terms of going straight down the camera. In terms of uh, answering your, your other question, um, the, the, the blackouts question, when everyone goes off and you get that weird Zoom screen, there isn't a way around that yet in the Zoom technology. So we have actually um, purposely just been working with plays that continuously happen in one time frame, that there are not cuts between scenes. Um, I have heard, and I know some other people who are using StreamYard, which is a different streaming software. Uh, that has some slightly different capabilities. I have not had the chance to explore that yet, but I believe if you're looking for that solution, you could find it there. Uh, and then also to answer your question about audience noise, which is a great one that we explored early on as well. Um, we actually found, because there is an option where you can have the audience turn on their microphones and, and actually in Zoom, you can adjust, have each audience member individually adjust their output volume down to say 15 or 20%. And I know I saw a show that Zoom Theater, the actual company Zoom Theater, T-H-R-E, um, did where they had the audience do that so the actors could hear some audience feedback. In our experiments, we found that having that live feedback with the audience um, sort of broke the uh, disbelief in the, in the medium of this idea that the audience is kind of a silent, almost voyeur and witness to the call. So we decided to just leave the call silent the way it would be if you were actually kind of the fly on the wall for a Zoom call, rather than have the audience live giving feedback during the show. I also want to uh, emphasize for everybody that Neil and Shared Screen have a very specific aesthetic. They believe in yeah. live web presentation. Uh, they're, they're not really inclined to go into a situation where they're going to uh, record everything and record multiple takes of scenes and then edit it all together in post-production. Um, I like the live, I, I like having a live element. Um, and I think you can tell the difference. Um, a friend of mine who has a production company argues strenuously that you can't tell something is pre-recorded and, and edited well. Uh, the audience who's viewing it out there in Zoom land cannot tell uh, that it was pre-recorded. They can't tell that it's not live. I'm not sure I completely believe that, but you certainly can create a sense of a live presentation with with editing. Um, how do you feel about that? Uh, you, you absolutely can. I mean, I myself am a video editor and for trailers and stuff that I've created for tape, I have post-produced. Uh, we found that there's, it was it's one of the beautiful things about live theater that you kind of block out that time to show up and be in that space with each other. And there's something, uh, there's a bit of a risk going on where you're, what you're watching is actually kind of walking the tightrope. Like there, there is a possibility of failure for the actors and tech on stage. And we think that's actually a really important element in terms of the intimacy and the immediacy. So creating that same sort of special time and space as well as risk and intimacy um, and at the same time, again, one of the things we found so necessary is a live talkback. And we think it just, you, we owe our audience in the talkback conversation, the fact that the actors were there live in that same moment with them. So we can really talk about specifically what happened during that show and understand what they were hearing and the feedback they're giving us and, and so on and so forth. So for us, live is very special. 
Now, uh, but I also think you're right, Bob, that really well done post-producing and editing can be done. Um, that's just a different art form and a different sort of uh, multimedia cross uh, with this medium and maybe film or short film. That's well, the difference between film and live theater is that things can go wrong in live theater that can't go wrong in film. So part of our sort of communal acceptance of theater is that somebody might forget a line and <laughs> something could happen. At minimum. Um, so um, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting, I don't think there's a, a, a right or a wrong about this. Yeah. I just think it's an interesting discussion and different people have very strong feelings one way or the other. Um, Ralph, is your hand still raised or, or is it raised a second time? Uh, oh, do I have to make it unraise? I thought oh, so I can un I can unraise it. That's okay. Unraise me. I'm done. Thank right. you, though. Great answers. I appreciate that. Okay, oh. Murray, Murray Davis, who inevitably was going to talk about this. She loves this piece. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I feel like I made a marriage. I have to tell you that for those in the audience, um, the piece that you're missing today is the fact that when I saw the show for the first time, and I've seen it now three times, you almost forget that you're watching Zoom and you feel like you're watching people on a stage, which is what this blew me away when that happened. And I've never experienced it. And that's why when I've been hearing people talk about the Zoom platform, why I felt it was so important for people to see this is that, again, you're seeing pieces and snippets. Um, hopefully you'll get to see it when it comes back in December, but it's the first time I have ever watched anything. And, and the story is also compelling because there's, I, I love anything with the twist and this has such a twist at the end, you cannot believe it but you actually feel like you're watching a, a show on the stage. And to me, that was amazing, not even knowing anything about the, the behind the scenes. But um, thank you. I'm thrilled that you, you know, I'm thrilled you did come. This is fantastic. And I want to remind everybody of something that Neil said earlier. Neil, Neil took a play that takes place in one location and rethought it so it took place in three locations. Um, and so basically, that's a way of saying that Neil is embracing the limitations of Zoom and finding a way to work within it. Um, he also said, if you didn't notice, if you didn't hear him, he also said that they tried working with virtual backgrounds. And uh, I don't re remember why he said you, you decided not to. But yes, you can create a sense of people being in the same uh, environment by having virtual shared virtual backgrounds. Um, the, the default that a lot of people go to is they say, use a neutral background. Well, neutral background could be beige, straw, ecru, uh, gray, it could be anything. And you still don't really have a sense of somebody being in the same place. I, I don't know, there's gonna be somebody who's skillful enough to make it seem like people are in the same room. Uh, I talked about that in post-production with sticks and, sticks and stones, but, um, you are basically saying we're in three different locations. This play that takes place in one room is going to take place in three different rooms. Yeah. So that's something to think about. That's, that's another choice that people need to think about when they're approaching new material. Yeah, and, and I will say that's a fundamental part of the um, adaptation process, which I didn't get to mention this, but actually uh, Stephen Delber, who is the playwright of tape, the Tony Emmy nominee, um, wrote the play Match that was nominated for Tony on Broadway and then directed that film that starred Patrick Stewart. Uh, he actually, I reached out to him to get permission to adapt this because we got adaptation rights from the dramatist and he actually worked with me on the adaptation. Um, and I also just want to say, going back to what oh, Mary said, thank you very much. Uh, I think that's something that I, I feel like I don't quite have the place to, to say it as the producer and, and the actor, but it's true. We had a lot of people actually say that you watch this and you forget it's on zoom the fact that it is zoom theater becomes secondary to the story you're watching and what you're experiencing and the the intimacy of the content um which i also think goes back to the importance of, of live and the importance of connecting to the camera i think those two things add to that the way that zoom then falls away and you're watching a story the other thing i just want to i just want to say one one word kinetic yeah. There's a lot of movement in what you do. Um, I think that's a lot, another thing that possibly Murray is, is responding to is the amount of movement that's going on uh, in her view. She's not, she's not looking at, at talking heads. Absolutely. And that's actually the reason why we didn't go with virtual backgrounds. 
because we found that in a virtual background, no matter how good the lighting was, when you moved, your hand would disappear off into wherever the, the, the graying screen was. And we needed the ability to have depth and motion in and out and around. So we built the real thing. Okay. Tita. I, I have an odd question. Oh, Zoom. good. We could use an odd question. <laughs> Zoom is um, for people who have Wi-Fi and certain level of tech. Mm. Uh, what are your thoughts about doing a play, a, you know, adapting a play that doesn't have characters that are Zoom savvy? That's a fascinating idea. For, for us um, to write them into the script, you, you would have to have them in some way. Um, we, we've actually, we have played in class with some scenes with characters that are not tech savvy. And it's a really fun joke for someone to talk them through like, no, 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 wait, 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 just, just press the, press the button, the, the little camera. Do you see the camera? Like it can be a really funny bit when you're writing them into the scene. Um, but I don't think yet we have a way to include them without acknowledging the medium that we're in. Tia, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Ed Levy. Hi. Um, are your characters always online when they're uh, when we're seeing them on the screen? I think the addict maybe at the beginning wasn't online he until was. he made the call. No, we're, we're, we're all always online. What, you, what you'd see at the real top of the show is things get spread as you see a moment where he clicks himself on Zoom and then really quick does a line before he calls the other character and says, hey, hey, get, get on the Zoom call. And then I arrive. We're, the characters are always online. You never see them before they come on. Um, so we always have a motivation for the character to start on the call or leave on the call. And that's, again, another part of the adapting process. Jenny Lynn, would you like to? Oh, wait a second. I've, uh, Eben, Eben, your your hand is up. Eben, are you there? I was holding. I was holding down the um, the space bar. It didn't work. <laughs> Second time happened. Lots of Sorry. things with Zoom don't don't always work the way we think they're <laughs> going to work. <laughs> it used to work. Anyway, um, <laughs> Neil. Um, how do you deal with the lag in Zoom and, and the fact that you only have one person having the audio? I mean, I so when you have yeah. two screens, I mean, the, technically it has to have an impact on what people are experiencing. Yeah. So um, in ter in terms of the lag, we uh, that's something that's that's often left up to the gods of Zoom. I mean, we do our best to have our highest speed internet connection at all times and. Through the Zoom webinar platform, when you have a paid webinar membership, that tends to get priority for their bandwidth. So we also get less lag that way, but we can't control for the download speeds on the audience end. Um, in terms of talking over each other, it's a really good point. And that's another thing that makes acting on Zoom difficult. And that's another reason we need our director, because if you do talk over each other, lines get lost and important information disappears. So we've got our director to you know, give us the notes on the moments where that happens. And also as an actor on Zoom, you have to be conscious enough to know that if you jump a line, someone's line just got lost. So you take a second to justify repeating what you just said if it was a really important moment of plot information. Like, well, hey, I don't think you heard me, stop talking. What I meant to say was, and you just stay in the scene. And that's how we've kind of gotten around that. But you do have to take turns. And in that way, you got to really jump on each other's lines because if not, the pace really, really slows to a crawl. So it exactly. takes, yeah, so it really, so what, I mean, it just takes extra, extra, extra work for the actor. I think that also- Can, I, can I have a, sorry, Bob, can I have a follow-up question? So how long did it actually take you in rehearsals to get to the point when you felt that you could actually have an audience in? For uh, we rehearsed for two weeks for this production. Um, again, we had been rehearsing in, in two weeks, we rehearsed from set 7 to 10 p.m. in the evenings, five days a week. Um, again, we're, the reason we can put stuff up really quickly and the reason that this works is because we have an incubator. Like we have 25 other actors who are doing this. So it's kind of, you know, the model of like the early school at Steppenwolf where they were creating uh, ensemble physical theater 
and they would work a play and work a play and bring in multiple readings. So by the time they actually got to the production, it could go really quickly and they have kind of a grab bag of vocabulary they can use. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. And, and Jenny Lynn, I was wondering if you would, do you want to share with Neil uh, some of what you were talking about uh, in, the, in the chat and sh share with the room or no? Oh, um, sh uh, sure. I, I was, we were just in the chat talking about it. I, no, I, I was just saying that I did a Zoom play where there was a s slightly different approach where we, where the director imagined the piece as being a site specific work set on Zoom. Huh. So, certain kinds of uh, wonkiness of Zoom were embraced and encouraged and the whole sort of live vibe. It was, it, was, it was also done in one take and then, you know, it was launched, recorded, but as if live. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so we just put the credits onto it and the, you know, that kind of thing. Would somebody and, please write a play, The Unbearable Wonkiness of Zoom? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of lovely, actually. Um, I really uh, applaud that because that's that's you're exactly right. The only way, the only thing we can do as artists is take the obstacle as the way. Like it's got to be the gift, um, and then it yeah. does give humor. And, and I, I, sh I should add that it wasn't a play that had to be adapted to Zoom. It was actually a play I wrote for Zoom, right? And it was about a guru who does hands-on healing training. Laying his hands, and he's very upset because his upcoming seminar has to be moved to Zoom during the pandemic. And how is he going to, you know, transmit the light, you know, over Zoom? And so it was interesting because I, you know, I brought it into my writers group, and everybody assumed it was about theater. But then when people in the New Age world or the healing world saw it, they said, "Oh my God, this is what's happening now." You know, people are doing telehealing and teleacupuncture, and everybody's struggling with this because. There's people who don't believe in these kinds of, you know, modalities anyway, but then on top of it, the people who do believe are thinking, well, I can do this. I know I can do this, but can I do it over Zoom? Mm -hmm. So, um, it, yeah, it became very meta, especially mm -hmm. when we found it. We managed to cast an actor who had never been on Zoom. So, <laughs> thanks. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up now <clears throat> because I want to leave some time for people to meet each other in, in uh, breakout rooms. Uh, Neil, can you stay so that people can meet you? I would love to, absolutely. Okay, so um, I want to thank you. Everybody can start coming back into the room now. I want to thank Neil for uh, for a great presentation and for a lot of information. And um, I'm I'm curious to see how many people are going to jump in and and try to do anything like what you're doing because everybody's saying how do we do it? How do we do it? Well, we got some answers today, um, so. Uh, run with it everyone yeah um, I, I, I would i would say before we wrap up i think we've found some answers to to how we do it our our next big thing to tackle is how do we tell people about it and how do we get the word out about it i mean that's the real challenge that we're looking to overcome for our december extension um is we i mean we tried everything we the mass emails i was posting on every social media platform three times a day we're reaching out to the press so on and so forth but now the big thing is how do you get word out about an internet form of art in a world where people are exhausted by social media and sick of screens and and make them even understand what what this is that we're doing so that's that's kind of the big thing now so we've got art we're learning how to tell people about it so I know I, I've, I've realized now that I, I cut out you had another presentation screen share presentation. all right that, that was all you needed to hear that so was it. I did okay. my job. They got it. <laughs> okay. Much yeah. appreciated. Absolutely. So I want to, again, thank you. And I want to thank everybody for being with us today. And uh, it's the weekly reminder that um, doing this uh, out of the goodness of our heart, but we also have bills to pay. So um, anybody who feels inclined to give a donation, uh, it's d www. It's not, we don't do www anymore. It's true online, tru-online.org slash make hyphen a hyphen donation it's all lowercase make hyphen a hyphen donation tricky tricky that isn't it um and you can also join as a member which we'd be very grateful for and um i hope that you'll join us next week um we're going to have uh, somebody who has a a, a virtual pl platform that they actually let other people use it's an opportunity for you to think of think of coming into an existing virtual platform and doing a show 
and um, we have other things planned through December now. So I'll keep doing it as long as you keep showing up. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>